Hey guys, your boy Chill here. Welcome back to C++ Multi-Threading. In the last video, we finished up our exception marshalling and our polling of the future status, and that's all good. Now, one thing I want to talk about here, in the comments in a few of the previous videos, people have kind of mentioned, wait a minute, Chili, this, uh, this future, this promise stuff, didn't, isn't there something for this already in the standard library? And uh, yeah, you caught me. You caught me red-handed. Simpsons did, in fact, do it first. This uh, stuff exists in the standard library. You can you can use it right now. Um, so you might be wondering, well, then, Chili, why did you go through you know all the painstaking task of making this? And I mean, you know, this isn't the first time I've done this. This isn't my first rodeo. The point of this is to give you a more in-depth idea of how all these things work and why they exist what what can they be used for why would you why would i ever want to use a promise in a future which is not completely apparent just looking at the standard library but once you go through the thing you build it yourself you see how it can be used then it all becomes clear and then you can go and you can look at the uh, the standard library future and you can say, ah, okay, I understand, you know, how you would use these things, why you would use them, and I'm happy to have them in there. That's the whole point of me, you know, building it up from scratch. But that being said, you know, I recommend, unless you have a compelling reason to build things from scratch, use the thing in the standard library. Because, you know, it's going to be a lot more tested, uh, a lot less chance of you running into bugs. It's a lot more robust. It has more features than this thing that I built. And it takes zero time to build this because it already exists. So for sure, use this. And let's just do a quick review of what this is, how it differs from the thing that we built, and uh, how you can use it. So... Here it is, you know, there's not a lot of things in the header, in the top level view, uh, but you see your familiar promise and your future, and they work basically the same as I've demonstrated. You got your get future, you can set a value, and uh, you can set exception. There's separate functions in this one. Very cool. You can also schedule value or exception to be set at the exit of the current thread, which is a neat little thing you can do. Um, and yeah, you get your future. It's, it's very similar. Um, what do we what do we have for future here? Get the value. Uh, you can check if it has a shared state. So this is interesting. You know, in my implementation, you can only get the shared state once, and then the future kind of becomes you know exhausted. And it's the same in the standard library. But you can check the exhaustion state, and uh, you can wait on that. You can wait for the future to become available, which is wait, but it doesn't actually get the result yet. And you can wait for a specific timeout or wait until a specific time point. So more options, but generally the same thing you can do. Now you might notice there's no ready function here, but actually what you can do is you can wait for and uh, you can wait for zero milliseconds. It'll return immediately. It'll give you a future status, and that status will tell you whether the future is ready or whether there, it would time out if it's not ready yet and you waited for zero milliseconds. So you know, you got you got options. It's promise and future. Pretty self-explanatory if you've watched my previous videos. But what about the other stuff in here? Uh, well, it turns out, so one feature of this library is it actually hides it completely encapsulates and hides the shared state. So you're not exposed to that, you don't have to worry about it, and the implementation can change um, between you know the different mechanisms that you use from the future library. Uh, so one way to get some shared state is to create a promise, you can break a future off that. Uh, the other way to get a future is you create a package task. And what that does is it allows you to get a future out, but unlike promise, it actually handles the setting of the exception or the value. Uh, so when you use package task, you pass it in, let me see if I can find a, the constructor here. Yeah, you pass it in a function that is to be called on the package task. And then you can execute the package task and that will, you know, set the shared state, make it ready at the future. Uh, so it's it's a little easier way to get a future. It handles the wrapping up of the function and into the promise. It doesn't actually use a promise under the hood. If you look at the implementation of MSVC, it does something different, which is perfectly fine. So yeah, you have a lowest level way to get a future is from the promise. Next level up is package task. And then 
there's another one. There is a function called async. You give that, you give async, you pass it your task, your function, and it will not only package it up for you, but it will also, you know, dispatch it to a thread and run it on a thread. So you don't even have to make like a thread pool or, you know, r create your own thread. It will handle that all for you. So you just throw it some kind of invocable thing. It will spit out a future and you can use that future to get the value at some point in the future yes uh and you can launch it there's a couple policies that you can launch it um asynchronously which will launch it on another thread you can also launch it deferred which will say okay you create this thing but you don't actually run it until you call the get of the future and then it'll run it on the same thread i don't know when you would want to do that but i'm sure it's a thing you'd want to do uh so yeah this is the highest level interface and it's not guaranteed to do a thread pool, but I have noticed that I think on Visual Studio, it does maintain a pool of threads in the background. So if you don't want to write your own thread pool, async might be something useful for you because you can just throw tasks at it and it will reuse threads in the background so you don't have the overhead of creating a new thread every time and you don't have to create your own thread pool. So that's another cool thing that exists and I've used this in the past. But like I said, I don't think it's guaranteed to do a thread pool and you don't have any control over how it manages the thread pool. So you might not want to use it in you know various situations where you want to guarantee that performance or that behavior. But it's a very easy way to uh, create a task with a future. And the final difference that I just want to touch on quickly here. So we know that future is basically built so that only one thread can access it and get the future. If you try to get from multiple threads, you're not going to have a good time. Here in the standard library, we can see after you call get, shared state is released and valid is false, so you cannot call get again. That means, yeah, only basically only one guy gets the bag, but you have this function here called share. And what that does is it basically, it uh, pilfers the shared state from this future, you can no longer use it, and gives you a shared future. And a shared future can be copied, can be accessed from multiple threads, can be gotten at multiple times. You see here, it does not say that the shared state is um, released. So once you have a shared future, you can copy it all around, you can, it's, it's pre-threaded, you can access it from anywhere. So you also have the option to basically free thread your futures, which we don't have in our thing. So very, lots of cool stuff, uh, much more solid, much more covering your ass, lots more, you know, bugs being tested and worked out of this. So definitely use it instead of building your own, unless you have a very good reason to build your own. All right, so now let's take a look at how we could rework our code to use some of the stuff from their library. We're not going to use async, although we could use async to launch our tasks, but we'll assume that no, we want control over our thread pool for whatever reason, And but we are gonna to try to use the future header to reduce the amount of code that we have to write. So if we do that, we don't need shared state anymore. We're gonna start off saying, okay, so what if we use promise, std promise? instead of our own promise. And so that we don't need promise and we don't need future. So we've just eliminated like, you know, I don't know how much, most of the code that we had to write. So what do we do now in our task? Let's start off by including future. All right, so in here in make, we create a promise. So instead of that, we're gonna create a std promise. And then the call in promise is just get future, I believe. And there you go, we've, all, we've already fixed it. Okay, so now down here, what do we see? Uh, all right, so some of these, these are intermediate things that test the lower level components, so we'll just remove those. Uh, and we will focus on this one and this one. So what do we have to change? It's not a lot here. We just gotta do lowercase because that's what the standard library, that's their fetish and I don't shame them for it. And here, while not featured already, so this one's a little different. Do I have, yeah, I have chrono literals. That'll make this a little nicer. So now if we want to check the status, we want to pull the status, we do a wait for zero milliseconds. So while this is not 
equal to std future status ready. So while we're not ready, we do our thing here, and then we get over here, and that's it. I think that's that's it. We've we've now just basically eliminated a bunch of code, changed like five lines, making things capital to lowercase, and it doesn't work. Okay, but that's fine. That's fine. Future tending to reference a deleted function. So this is interesting to me, a little piece of C++ that I'm always not 100% sure of. So we are, in many cases, when we create a local variable in a function and then we return that at the end, the, the copy, the move gets elided and it basically just gets teleported to the place uh, where this function is being called. Uh, but does that technically ca count as a copy or a move? That's always the thing that kind of gets me. And does this, the way that we create it, does that have any, I don't know. So, but what we can do here, and I think this will probably, if, it, if the issue is what I expect, then this will probably make the compiler happy. We just move the future out. All right, so yeah, promise set here. These ones weren't caught because this was inside of a uh, template, so the IntelliSense did not work so well. All we want to do here is promise dot, all right, set value. Here we want to set exception. This will probably work. Let's see what the compiler says. All right, so this one's a little annoying if you're not steeped in the, uh, the template metaprogramming knowledge. Uh, these error messages can break your soul and uh, corrode your resolve, but it's actually not that crazy as to what's going on here. So basically, we're creating this uh, lambda, this function object with a promise. We're going to forward it in. That's fine. This is a R value, so as long as it's been you know moved in, this should be fine. Except the problem is we want to create, let me just get rid of this here. We're going to create a function with it. Uh, now the thing about std function is it wants to be able to be copyable. And we can't copy this because we can't copy a promise. It doesn't make any damn sense. Uh, so there we are at a little bit of an impasse here. Uh, std function, we need this to wrap, to erase the type of the callable so that we can, you know, put them all in a single container. Ah, but std function, <laughs> so sweet. This is the problem many people have had, an issue with std function. And in C++23, we get std move only function. Now, here's the question. This is C++23. It's uh, 2023. Do we have move only function? Hallelujah, we have it. We have it. Okay, so this should fix the problem. We'll see. We'll see if it comes up with something new for us. The boys on the standard committee, they got our back and uh, we are all clear. Now the moment of truth, we run it. So far, so good. We're getting our exceptions, they're propagating. Uh, we're doing our polling, it's working. And the task is ready, value is 69. So it works exactly the same, but it's a hell of a lot less code. And it's also, you know, it's more solid, right? If we, if we screw up how we're using the promise, it's gonna let us know. All right, so that's pretty damn amazing, but can we do better? We need to go deeper. Now we erase task. No more task. What can we do now in Threadpool to replace our task? Well, let's replace our deck of task, which doesn't exist anymore, with a deck of move only function void. So there's our tasks. Mainly, the only thing that needs to change here is this, and the rest should just go with it. Um, let's do, first of all, because this is picking up something, some other code in the global scope, I think we go here. Yeah, this thing. So that's not right. Let's change that. So task is equal to this thing. And then, okay, so we'll just change this here to task. That'll match up everything that's already in our program. We see a lot of squigglies go away. Yeah, this one is the one that's left. So we fix this up and we're all good to go. So how do we now do this? Well, we're gonna use package task and that is going to, you know, handle a lot of the stuff that was handled in our other task class. Now the thing about package task is it's templated on the return or the, uh, the function signature here. 
So it doesn't do any type erasure. Every package task for a different signature is a different type. They won't all fit in the same container. So we got to erase them, wrap them up in our function object, our move only function void. So first things first, let's do this one step at a time. First, let's erase the arguments by binding them into the package task. We're going to figure out the return type of our function that we passed in. We'll create a package task that has the arguments erased. So we're going to bind them into the function f. Let's break the future off that package task. And then let's erase the, yeah, the return type information. And then under the mutex, we should be able to move that task into our container. Now, it doesn't like this, uh, and I'm not exactly sure why. Perhaps this needs to be mutable. Okay, that seems to have done it. It's fair enough, because this is probably going to be const, and this is not guaranteed to be const. So yeah, fair enough. Uh, and now we have erased all the things. So this might work, but we'll see. IntelliSense might have missed some things that are in templates. Yeah, built on the first try, amazing. Okay, and now because we have changed the way we're creating the future, it seems to the static analysis is saying, hey, don't move this. So let me try rebuilding it like this. Maybe that has fixed that weirdness. Okay, good. So now it works like I, I expected it would work originally. And there we go. We have eliminated, like, I don't know how much percent of the code. We've just destroyed all of our code. And if it works the same, this is pretty good indication that you should be using the standard library. Yeah, because it's going to make your life different. This is the difference between the de dev who knows their standard library to the dev who has no idea of what's in there. The task can take two hours versus, you know, two days or maybe two weeks when you include all the debugging time. Moral of the story, know your standard library. Use your standard library because it's good shit. But that's about going to do it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to start, I'm going to look at some uh, performance implications of using our thread pool for different types of tasks and a very interesting kind of conceptual framework uh, on how you can handle load balancing and scheduling when you're dealing with both asynchronous tasks and compute heavy tasks. But until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more C++ multi-threading.